Good afternoon. Uh, let me begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello and welcome to the third virtual Partners in Technology interactive webinar. Uh, today I'm pleased to have Dr Sarah Pearson, who's the Deputy Director General Innovation with the Department of Innovation, Tourism and Industry Development co-hosting with me. Um, before we start, I'll quickly run through a little bit of housekeeping. Today's webcast is being recorded and if technical difficulties arise, you'll be able to see the recording later today uh, using the same link. Uh, and also later in the session, we'll have a question and answer um, that's going to be moderated by my colleague Mark Sidney. Uh, Mark will take questions uh, during the process of today, so please keep them coming through. And uh, he'll also guide you through the interactive features before we commence the QA later in the broadcast. Uh, I just wanted to go on with the fact that the last couple of weeks have gone by very fast and I really wanted to thank everybody that provided feedback on how the process is going and, and also uh, the really large number of responses that we had uh, in, in terms of people providing resources that we were asking for to government. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that during the process of today. Um, we've been working uh, really at a flat out pace, maintaining our business as usual activities, but also looking at the challenges associated with um, creating the responses to COVID that are necessary in this environment in such an accelerated pace. So things that were taking a year last year take a week this year. Now, it doesn't mean it's the same thing, but it really means that we're having to pivot the way that we're delivering based on what's the minimum that we can do to actually get the outcomes that we need without all of the normal, I suppose, rigour and uh, process that's behind a lot of government activities. And I think that's been reflected pretty much across uh, the planet. So um, you're reading quite a lot in the, the media, both the trade media and the general media, just about how um, much the environment has changed, how things are moving towards digital and how that's actually created some really great positive responses in transition to digital, but also um, what it's meant to some of the other industries. So. There's been global disruption to ICT and, and we're definitely seeing impacts on things such as uh, employment in the ICT sector. So there's been a slowing in that in, in, in a lot of cases that's been slightly offset by an increase in some of those areas like remote working and, and quite a lot of the digital transactional activity. Uh, so there's sort of that uh, increase in, in, a very, in, a, in a segment of the, of the industry but uh, slowing in general uh, states around that. And, uh, that's, I think, one of the things that we can look at in terms of government, being able to work with uh, the, the digital and IC industry to make sure that we can continue to maintain um, some velocity in Queensland to help us uh, not only get through this um, COVID pandemic, but also have a, a good and thriving digital and ICT industry post-pandemic. Uh, so uh, we're also looking at a couple of things in our environments around having the right, the right type of resources and, and I'm sure Sarah will have uh, lots of comp, um, input on this later on today. We're, we're actually looking at do we have in Queensland the right ICT skills and capabilities and do we have the right underpinning uh, infrastructure and services to support the digital and ICT industry. And we are working very closely in government and with um, the, the industry and with the academic sector at the moment to look at how we can ensure that we can utilise things such as the federal government's training and uh, new training program to look at getting people back into work after COVID-19, how we can actually utilise that in the digital and ICT industry to create new roles that are going to be effective in delivering new services that I think will become really the expectation of citizens and businesses post-COVID pandemic. Um, so I think the next one that I'd like to bring up is the fact that um, there's been recent media that's talked pretty much about um, the, the COVID-19 um, uh, spread has, has the curve has been flattened out and there's been a lot of success in doing that. And I'd, I'd just like to point out that there's been quite a lot of work in the digital space that's actually supported that. And I'm sure Sarah is going to talk a lot about uh, things that have come forward for, into her area around innovation and COVID-19. Um, but I think it's actually a great indication of the capabilities within our environment to actually show 
just how good a response we can get from citizens and businesses and especially in the startup community and some of those things that have come up with some great innovation in responding to COVID. Uh, so the last forum, I think we also uh, talked about what we were doing to help accelerate um, work within the digital and ICT community. And we had a lot of feedback on that. So I thought I would just run over it again on the basis of the fact that we have now created a procurement capability for COVID-19, which is an emergency response. So um, we have a short form contract that we've made available to work with government now. And as I said last time, it's got a couple of characteristics that are, I think, very uh, important. So they have a total ICT value of less than a million dollars or up to a million dollars. And the contract duration is an agreement of no more than 12 months. Now, we have a, a slide at the end that's actually going to talk about the addresses where you can go for all the specific information, because I'm talking quickly. Um, but the, the guide will be on the Queensland Government sites under 4 gov qld.gov.au slash procurement policy. So we're, we've actually had some uh, quite good response to that now. So we've already had, I think, five agencies that have taken up the use of this, um, this new contracting framework to accelerate things. So there is no lead time associated with that procurement. And, and I think in our world of government uh, uh, procurement, that, that is in fact a <laughs> revolution rather than an evolution in those spaces. I also wanted to just uh, call out that we have also continued with a number of um, procurements that were actually on uh, commenced before the pandemic um, declaration inside Queensland within government. So uh, there was a, a few questions from the last view that were saying, what's happened with all of the, um, the procurements that were underway. And I think we did talk about the fact that some of them have been paused because we don't have the resources or the, or the ability to focus on the activities that were going on. But a number of them have recently been completed. So I think there's four, um, four uh, ICT engagements that, that were COVID-19 related that have actually gone through a full procurement activity. And I wanted to make sure that we were talking about this uh, pretty openly in the pit because I think it's very significant that we need to keep up the positive aspect of continuing work within Queensland Government. So uh, whereas almost all the energy of government is actually turned to uh, working through the pandemic, uh, we are actually aware of the impacts of the greater community and how we can actually support that. So uh, we are doing uh, uh, a lot around the speedy payment of invoices to our um, partner environment. We're also making sure that we're considering those aspects of what's happening with the contractor world, what's happening with the professional services capabilities, and what's happening to those um, small uh, ICT, digital and ICT providers. And again, we have some really specific capabilities in the small to medium business that we're able to apply to engage on a very easy basis um, with that level of the community. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're actually uh, supporting you so that, as I said at the beginning, on the other side of this, that we have an, uh, a vibrant and sustainable digital and ICT community in, in Queensland, um, specifically looking to focus on uh, the support in Queensland. That doesn't mean that we're not still going to have our national partners doing work for us but we have got a really strong focus on making sure that we can deliver good services to uh, the, sorry, support our businesses in Queensland during this time. Uh, so uh, in terms of what's going on next, uh, we thought it might also be something that the uh, community here was interested in to have some advice um, and some input around what some of the research organisations are saying that, that the COVID-19 is doing in terms of change. So we're just trying to sort out the details, but I think at our next session, we will be looking at, or maybe the session after, I have to just to confirm, uh, we'll be having a research organisation come in and talk about what they're seeing as the state, national and global impacts around the digital and ICT community and how, those, um, how that might actually occur now and what might happen going through to the end of the COVID pandemic and when we get back into more normal times. 
what, what we think will be the aftermath of COVID-19 in terms of digital and ICT communities. Um, now, I've, I've talked quickly and I'm hoping that uh, some of that information got through. But as we sort of contemplate these priorities, I think I'll hand over to Dr. Sarah Pearson so that uh, Sarah can talk to us about her aspect and interactions with government and um, the, the innovation area. Thanks, Sarah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we're meeting on and you're on uh, today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And also to acknowledge their many thousands of years of being incredible scientists and innovators them themselves. And we have something very, to be very proud of. I'd like to thank you, Chris, for inviting me. It's great, great to be here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are in very challenging times. I know that we all have uh, big challenges that we're facing and I know that all of us are also trying to help people as they go through those challenges. There are also opportunities and I'm going to balance those two in the talk that I want to give you today. Um, and I'm going to be quite high level from a sort of more of a visionary strategic perspective and then dive down into a few details. So I titled it Innovation in Times of Challenge. And I wanted to start with life will never be the same again. I know that COVID is enormous but there have been other enormous challenges that we've faced in very recent months. Uh, I was in um, Canberra when the fires were hitting, and I have to say that as a, as a human, I found it incredibly confronting, and I was convinced that life would never be the same again. Walking down a street, not being able to see your hand for several days <laughs> uh, was incredibly confronting. Obviously, you in Queensland have had a lot of experience with floods. I say you because I've only just got here. I've been here three months. Um, so the floods have obviously been an issue. And we have the, the virus with us now, which is a global, a global issue. I think, uh, as Chris was saying, we're working differently. We are uh, studying differently. We are uh, socialising differently and working differently. And I think that a lot of that will change how we do all of these coming through it. So life will never be the same again. But there is good news as well, and this is where ICT, technology, STEM all come together to give us hope. And I'm hearing this in the last few days, people have been saying to, to us, we need some hope. It's great there's this response that we're, we're going through, but they also want some hope to see things at the end of the, tubble, uh, end of the tunnel. One stat, um, knowledge is doubling every 12 months. That will soon be every 12 hours. Now that can be quite a frightening uh, statistic because my goodness, how do we cope with that? But it's also quite an exciting statistic. If we think we could have access to that sort of data, that amount of data, imagine what we can do with it. If we can get our ICT, our AI, um, big data analytics, et cetera, sorted so that we can really make the most of that. I've got some examples here, which I won't go through all of them, but some, some great ideas and some science and technology, which gives us a lot of good news and a lot of hope. Maxwell Plus, for instance, um, a big data AI platform that looks at prostate cancer, how to predict uh, whether people have prostate cancer. Helps um, actually be a lot more specific and sensitive than even our current very wonderful specialists. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been to the doctor in the last few weeks and you've experienced a telehealth um, experience and I certainly found it good good myself I don't really have time to go to the doctor it was wonderful to be able to just tell your presence in and, and get that sorted so these are things that are helping us now uh, V2 food is a company looking at future proteins if we want everyone to have protein around the world we will need five planets that's bad news the good news is that we have some neat ways of, of designing and developing and producing proteins that taste like meat look like meat feel like meat and yet they're not and they're actually quite sustainable um, Miriota is a wonderful startup, actually based down in Adelaide, that has microsatellites that it has been launching, and then it uses IoT to um, to use IoT in agriculture, so that we can be more efficient and productive in our agriculture. If we're going to feed 10 billion people, or however many it's going to be, we need to be addressing these things, and ICT is a key way of doing that. And then down the bottom of the middle there, I've got the wonderful UQ example um, that uh, we have been supporting. Obviously, as soon as we get a vaccine, life will go back to not necessarily the same as it was, but at least we'll have a bit more movement than we have now. And scientists I know are working 24-7. So there is good news. It's not all bad news. And it gets even better. Um, one day we will be cyborgs. So uh, I know I feel very frustrated with my body and how it's collapsing as I've been getting older. But one day we'll be a mix between uh, the cyber and the human physical uh, bodies. And this is quite an exciting time. And even before that, we may well have microchips in our brains. Um, and I, again, I can uh, really 
uh, align with the thought of having a microprocessor in my brain that could deal with all that 12, you know, data doubling every 12 hours, wouldn't that be neat if my, my brain could do that through a, a microprocessor? So that might sound quite futuristic, but there are people working on that right now around the world, and it's not, uh, not as far away as you'd imagine. And it's possible. So my previous role um, as Chief Scientist and Chief Innovation Officer in DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, did a lot of work around injecting innovation and ICT into aid, so how we go about international development and how we help people in developing countries to take on these new technologies. A couple of examples I've got there. One is Rwangaroo. It's an online platform for educate, educating students in uh, Jakarta. They realized that students were dropping out of school and they thought an online platform might help. They now, after I think it's been about three years they've been going, have 13 million students on that platform. A couple of young entrepreneurs in a developing country developed this incredible tool which is now teaching loads and loads of children. The other one is about, um, uh, what do you call it, specialised learning for each, each individual child. So this is actually in Cambodia. Uh, where there is no internet connectivity except in some of the big cities. So uh, what this company does, um, they take iPads, download specialised education for each individual child onto the iPads, put them on the back of a moped, take them out to the village. The kids do their specialised learning process, all gets analysed back at HQ, back on the moped, and then new stuff downloaded and back out to the, to the schools. The point I want to make there is it is possible in times of challenge, even when you are super challenged. So uh, I want to give you a bit of hope that we can actually do these things no matter what is happening in the world. I also wanted to make the point that economies will never be the same again. Um, they haven't been for some time, and I think that is going to accelerate. If you look at the predictions of future economies, 75% of future high-growth jobs will need STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. 65% of them don't yet exist. It makes it a bit of a challenge when you're trying to encourage young people into STEM because the jobs that they're going to be going into don't exist. How do you encourage them into those jobs? So we, are, we have been challenged for decades uh, in terms of encouraging young people into STEM, but it is increasingly important. Uh, and if you look at the stats on the top right there, it talks about some of the countries which are doing really well in terms of that education. And um, I know that we've still got a, a fair way to go in Australia. Diversity in all of this is key too. It's not just about STEM, it's not about, just about technology. We need to have esteem. So E is for entrepreneurship. So making sure that we have people who can actually build these new industries, these new companies. But also the arts are important too. For instance, if you want to use AI, you're going to need to know about anthropology. Um, and psychology so that you can make sure you're developing it in the right way. And I always have to say something about um, gender diversity in my talks. As a woman in leadership, I like to bring up uh, gender diversity. And I'm not going to bang on about how fabulous women are, but we are really are fabulous. <laughs> and there's some statistics that you can read there at your leisure. I'm sure that uh, the, the guys here will let you have access to the deck later and you can see that uh, how it is that we're doing so well as, as women. But we still are very underrepresented and need to bring more women in, into entrepreneurship and to STEM. Now, other countries are addressing that. I'm not saying that Australia isn't. We have been. But some of them are really, really advanced. Israel, for instance, known as the startup nation, incredibly advanced in terms of its innovation uh, and technology-based economies. They've attracted a lot of large multinationals. They're now seen as the place to go to get um, ideas and buy new companies. Uh, particularly around cybersecurity, that's one of them. China, China's, I went to China about five years ago in, for an Australia Week in China mission, and I was not expecting to see the level of sophistication that I saw in terms of the startup ecosystem and the money. I was sat next to a, a fellow from a VC company that had 100 billion yuan, so 25 billion Aussie dollars in that one VC firm. At that point, Australia had 1 billion. Aussie dollars in our VC industry. So, um, and there's a lot of people who, Chinese people who've been to Silicon Valley, done their thing, made a lot of money, they're coming back and really building uh, great things in China. And of course, a large proportion of AI investment um, is in China. India, um, India is building the world's largest co working space, startup co working space, as we speak. So they're very ambitious. And in Vietnam, they realize that their low cost manufacturing base cannot continue. They need to move into Industry 4.0. And uh, I was at an event where the Prime Minister of Vietnam uh, was there the whole morning. He gave a fabulous half-hour talk about the socio-economic impact of innovation and STEM. And then within an hour, all of our talks were up online so that everyone could listen and see and on the news that night. So the hunger in some of these countries is phenomenal. And if we think that they're not going to leapfrog us if we continue with a slow pace, then we are kidding ourselves. 
Queensland, I put here ahead of the game. We, we really are doing a fabulous job, and this has nothing to do with me. You have been doing this for at least the last five years, if not 20 years. You know, the smart nation, the smart state has been going for, for quite some time. And then, of course, advanced Queensland for, for about five years. I've got a few stats here in terms of some of the impacts. Um, this is last year's stats, uh, 17,800 jobs from Advanced Queensland so far. A large number of these are in the regional Queensland. Obviously, regions are incredibly important and was something that attracted me to Queensland. I love the idea of working across all the state and helping Queensland industry and hubs. Uh, lots of projects you'll see there. And also, the wonderful thing is that lots of money has been committed by non-government program partners. Uh, a lot of my work in the past has been, or my last role, was around the Sustainable Development Goals. We are $2.5 trillion short of reaching the SDGs. So governments cannot um, do that. They need to do it by leveraging uh, other money. And it's the same when you're building innovative economies. You need others to be jumping in with their resources. So what have we been doing here in Advanced Queensland through COVID? Um, I've been here three months. Um, after four weeks, COVID hit. Two weeks later, we're all work working from home. So it's been somewhat of a, definitely a tech experience. And I have to say, it's been a good tech experience. Um, uh, being used to um, working with tech, it hasn't been an issue for me. And I'm so glad that the team have been working well in that too. So thank you for all your support that you've been giving. Um, we have changed our team uh, to be a couple of teams. One, to do the critical business as usual. So not necessarily business as usual, business as usual, but there's some things that need to still happen. And uh, we have a team looking after that. But we have another more agile um, rapid response team that is actually responding to direct needs. And we're moving through this response recovery resilience sort of a program. In the um, response phase, we've been w working with our stakeholders to see what they need. We've been lobbying the federal government to make sure that federal programs reach uh, the needs of startups and scale ups and innovative businesses in Queensland. We've been working across the uh, Queensland government to make sure the Queensland programs also um, work for, for our stakeholders. And uh, we've also been pivoting some of our programs. So some of our programs that are out, uh, we've been saying, OK, we actually now need them to respond to COVID or a COVID-like situation, because this won't be the last COVID. Um, so we've been doing that. And then wonderful people, over 130 ideas have been presented to us of, of solutions. And a lot of them are technology solutions, but, you know, obviously STEM as well, um, that will help the Queensland to address and respond to the COVID crisis that we have. We're now working with those through a process to uh, help some of those go to the right places, and Chris is involved in that, so it's been good to work with Chris on some of those uh, opportunities. Some go to health, some have been going to education, and some we are supporting ourselves. Well, I want to thank you. If there's any of you, thank you for um, submitting your ideas. That's been fabulous. We are moving into the next phase of that, which will be to give you an idea of the sorts of challenges and the things that government is interested in. So an open innovation approach, which is saying, this is what we need, this is what we would love to have, and coming, going to you as the, the stakeholders uh, and, and the community and saying, has anyone got solutions to this? Or even co-designing some of those solutions. Um, we've been working with the innovation hubs across Queensland and seeing how we can help them. Part of that, obviously, is pivoting some of their um, contracts, because obviously there's a lot of things they can't do now that they were doing in the past, and helping them with that. But we want to move to the next phase of how do we make these real central hubs of building new industries um, and connecting with that skills base. We've also been talking with Desbit and others uh, around skills, skills building. Um, and of course, within our community, within the startup com or part of our community, the startup community, there's lots of amazing people with great skills that if we can connect them with companies that need those skills, that could also help them uh, through this period. And if there are companies out there who are looking for solutions for their own challenges, we can also connect you into uh, that community of, of ideas. And then, of course, there's the universities. So working with the universities to see how we can help them with the next phase, because we need to make sure that we still have that continuity of pipeline of new businesses, new ideas going forwards um, and support for those. I'd also like to thank our community who have been reaching out to us in terms of helping. So not just with ideas uh, involving technology, such as how to educate um, kids um, online or how to trace and, tr and uh, track COVID cases or how to uh, develop new cures or how to work with PPE. We've also had people coming to us saying we would like to help the community. So we would like to help uh, tech SMEs who are, um, need support going through this, this COVID phase. We would like to help work with the startups to help, uh, help with them. So we're about to set up a bit of a platform that will help with that matchmaking. That gives you just a, a few top line ideas of some of the things that we're doing. But there, there is more, but they're just the ones that come to mind. We have been doing a lot of response, but it's like a segue. Um, a lot of response with a bit of recovery in, in our back of our minds. And now recovery is coming much more to the forefront 
of our minds and we're starting to put our heads together with our community about what that recovery would look like. From my experience, part of recovery and resilience is actually making sure that our ecosystems, which include schools, universities, entrepreneurs, investors, big business, small business, government, service providers, growth providers, all of those, how do we make sure that we're connecting all of those? Because I think once they're well connected and trusted and sharing, um, then we will be much more resilient. Uh, I think a lot of work has been done on that in the past few years, but COVID will take us to the, and, and out of COVID will take us to the next, next level of that. So we'll be working to make sure we've got these ecosystems and you'll be able to look at this and see the framework that um, it's one that um, I and others have been developing over time. Um, and I've applied in Canberra, so the Canberra Innovation Network, um, to the Hunter IF project, which is the Hunter's um, idea of an ecosystem, and then across the Indo-Pacific through Scaling Frontier Innovation, which I encourage you to go and have a look at all of those to see what they're up to. But I, uh, the bigger picture for me is thinking about how we come out of this as new industries, new government, and new society. So Chris, you talked about the things that you're putting in place now that you hope will be ways that will be normal when we come out of this. Certainly, I find it really interesting that in times of crisis, government can be incredibly agile. Outside of times of crisis is not as well known for being as agile, but how do we make sure that we can uh, retain some of this agility as we come out and we have this recovery and resilience piece? How can we be more open, more connected and collaborative um, through delivery of our government services? Is government the one to deliver some of the services? Are some that actually really government should step out of the way and let others deliver? Because in today's world, they'd be better at delivering it. So how do we have this new government? The new industries piece is obviously um, tech is deeply involved in the new industries. Now that means not just new industries like, you know, for instance, space uh, and space technology, but also current industries that just could do with a hand around technology to be increasing their productivity, but also to increase their market reach and their products, products and services. So it's not all just about productivity, it's about increasing the services that you have. And obviously the tech community will be very important in that. We're thinking of moving to Industry 4.0, um, Internet of Things, what do we do with big data in health, etc. There's so many opportunities. And we have been, you know, Queen, Queensland has been doing a good job working on that, but now how do we accelerate that? Because the world will not be the same again. The countries around us are certainly not waiting. Um, and if we want to be globally competitive, we need to move into that fast. And then new societies, how do we, how do we live differently? Are we going to spend more time working at home? I've been really quite enjoying working at home. It's, it's been amazing. I can go into back-to-back -back meetings without having to go between one room and another, which means I can be even more productive probably not very good for me health-wise, but um, it's been really interesting to see how we're all taking on. In fact, people, I think, are quite enjoying it. So some sort of a mix of that. Um, and there'll be all sorts of other ways that we will change the way that we work. For instance, being, uh, sorry, yeah, the way as humans uh, communicate, the way we socialise. Uh, I'm sure that will be changed forever. Biosecurity is probably going to make a big difference to, to our societies. So it's really our choice. Um, do we want to go with the high growth industries, the high growth jobs, the agility in government, the collaboration around solving challenges? Do we want to draw our young people into this world that they're going to need to be in if they want to be in high growth, um, high paid uh, jobs? And if they want to be solving the global challenges, I, talk, I started right at the beginning, life will be, never be the same again because of these challenges. We'll need to solve them somehow. Do we want that? I'd say yes. And I have a favorite quote that goes with this, which is people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. And I know that you are all doing this in one way, shape or form. And my rally cry is, how do we do this together? So thank you very much for your time. And I think uh, that's all I'm going to say and open for questions, I believe, from here. So thanks. Thanks very much, Sarah. And, and, and I think um, some great, great points in that space. Uh, w we used to talk in government about two speeds. I think we need to get way beyond two in these things now. And those aspects of working with the, with the broader community on how services can be delivered, not necessarily by government only, but by others as well. And then how government acts as the ability to connect those services yeah. together in a good way and make sure that they fit a standard that's appropriate for citizens and businesses. So I think there is, uh, again, a very, very big upside of uh, coming out of a crisis. So. Um, you know, most of the greatest innovations in our time have come post-crisis and mm. there is the opportunity for this to happen here as long as we've got the right people around 
that can continue to do that. So making sure that we've got the right environment to build up our digital and ICT community is, is going to be critical. And again, government has well and truly recognised its place in supporting that, both in making sure that we build the right capabilities, that we engender the right level of innovation um, that's coming through by being that underpinning sponsor on some of those innovation hubs, but then really tying it back up into business to grow mm. those things and make sure that they can actually expand out. I think, Sarah, when we talked the first time, you talked a lot about um, just how much innovation there is in Queensland, mm. but sometimes that it didn't scale out effectively, and it's because we've got to get the right settings to make sure that it can actually grow out to those levels as well. Mm. As well as the international connectivity and visibility, and I think it's interesting, at a time when you can't travel, you can still be very connected globally, and it's a, it's a good opportunity to, to do that. And, and I think uh, also that aspect of the new norms and mm. what we're going to accept now. So, you know, a uh, large number of face-to-face -face business transactions for governments, um, lots of people having to take a long time to do things, you mm. know. Um, we, we saw some incredible take-up in digital services across the, the Commonwealth. Um, we've seen a change in people's perceptions about how they deal with government what they're willing to provide in terms of information and those challenges are going to continue as well. And, and I think it comes forward to government to be very open and very proactive about how um, they're working with the industry, how they're using information, how they're using these new applications to, to support the citizens. Mm. Yep. Um, so again, thank you Sarah for the insights and I'm sure that there's been uh, a number of questions online. So I might hand over to Mark to guide us through the Q&A. Mark. Yeah, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so I've had a uh, question come through. Um, Sarah, how are you seeing innovation where it used to have 20, 30, 50 people in a room? How is that being affected or being addressed in this um, new, well, 1.5 metre of, of social distancing? Mm. Um, I have been amazed how easy it's been to work with a, a group of people um, through our IT services, it's been fantastic. You know, I'm not going to talk about which platforms we're using, but you know, we're using platforms where um, I can walk into my office at home and there I have, could have 30, could have 100 people, and you can see their faces and you can interact. It is challenging uh, because you don't get, uh, it's difficult to get all the facial cues um, uh, all at once because there's so many of them all looking at you at the, at the time. I think there's some people who find it challenging if they're introverts uh, because they feel that you know, there they are being seen all the time. So mm. there are some challenges with it, but I have found it quite amazing. I mean, the round tables we've run with, so for today, for instance, I think there are about 30 people on our round table where we're discussing what are some of the opportunities going forwards. And uh, it's, it's actually, in some senses, easier than having it in a room where you're all in the same room uh, because I think there are some of the social barriers that are not there. You're just, you just know it's difficult, so you all get on with it. I wonder, Sarah, whether there's some of the normal social dominance things, yes. you know, big, yeah. big actors in a crowd who tend to dominate more mm. that sort of is lessened by that, that whole remote yes. aspect. Yes, I think it is, yes. The thing that mm. I miss, which I'm sure there's tech out there, but I haven't um, used it yet, is uh, sticky notes, <laughs> post-it notes. And I know there, are, there is software that you can do it, but it's difficult to have the one screen and have everybody on it and do the post-it notes. Someone might have a solution to that, but um, yeah, that, I missed that. Well, there actually are some good solutions for that. Queensland Health, um, the e-health facility, have a, a really amazing digital sticky wall. Yeah. And it can be um, people in the room as well as um, point, doing it yes. remotely. So it's really quite good. Yeah. Uh, so another question that came through was um, in regards to... Uh, partner groups discussions and, and visualising innov innovation engagement. Um, what sort of thoughts do you have on that? I mean, how, how, do we, how do we do that with, I guess, slightly more uh, separate groups of people? Um, are you talking about how we solve challenges with different people or what's the... Um, I don't quite understand it, sorry, do you want to... Um, I, I guess um, when you're uh, in, in, the old, in the olden days, what's that, eight yes. weeks ago, yeah. um, a human-centred design workshop, for example, yes. would yeah. have 5, 10, 15, 20 people in the room and yeah. it would be worked through together. And in some of those instances, it was usually just with one partner. Yeah. All right. So yeah. it might have been one facilitator, partner, etc., and, mm. and a couple of staff from that group. And so how does that work with multiple partners? And do you see that as a different problem to um, the no. innovation? I mean, that's an interesting one. Uh, back in my old role, we actually 
brought, well, first of all, we were looking for a specific idea. We wanted to know how to help broker deals between on, uh, investors and investees, and we had no idea how to do that across the Indo-Pacific. So we went out to the market and we asked a range of people to come up with ideas. There were about 20 of them that were okay but weren't quite right. So we then brought all of those 20 into a room, which you can do into a virtual room, to discuss what was actually needed. So actually defining the problem with partners right up front. Instead of going to the market with, hey, we've got this problem, give us a solution, it was actually we're not quite even sure what the problem is. Can we work with you around the problem? Um, we did that whilst we had uh, a, a procurement person with us in the room, which was uh, great because then they could tell us when we were in and out of <laughs> the procurement boundaries. Um, and then we told, we said to people, great, now we've got the challenges that we, we really know need to be solved because you've told us they need solving. You go away and collaborate and we will decide the six or whatever that we will support. But you must come back as a collaborative group. We won't, we won't support just the one partner. Um, and that, you know, the, the stakeholders that we worked with were very very um, supportive of that and that program has now been going really well. I think it was challenging at first, and I'm not sure if I'm answering exactly what the question is, but the, it was challenging at first because there were competitors in the room. Mm. So that's that point to having different partners uh, in the room. Um, but they realised that by doing something together they could do more than they could do on their own and very quickly they, they actually um, combined and, and it worked really quite well. In terms of different partners from the perspective, I'm just unpacking this in case there's several dimensions to it. In terms of different partners from different sectors, such as having the research base and the industry base and the government base together, you know, one of the challenges there can be the culture, because the culture of those three in the triple helix are really quite, quite different. Um, I've been involved in some great workshops based on a technique that the University of Cambridge developed quite some time ago and Innovate UK. Now Innovate UK are building their in innovative industries. Uh, they use it and it brings those, that triple helix together and they work to agree the vision, they work to agree what the actions are um, from a research perspective, a regulation perspective, capability building perspective, opportunity uh, perspective. So I think if you can bring people together around a common goal then that can really help those disparate partners. I don't know if that was exactly what they were asking, but there's a, there's a couple of angles to that question. Sarah, I, I think um, another really good example of that is I think that this environment has actually created more of a permission environment to come in with new ideas. Yeah. And in fact, um, we've seen with the digital and ICT industry, we had a, a general um, feeling of dis, you know, unease around our cyber security profile because mm -hmm. there was a, obviously an a increased risk. And we actually had um, a collaborative approach come forward to us, mm. saying, here's a bunch of people in this sector who mm. want to work together to provide an overlay service as an additional layer of protection for government. And, mm. and again, um, in a normal competitive environment, that would never have happened. And I think mm. this is, again, one of those opportunities to create something that's greater than the individual, so yes. to get that synergy associated with mm. um, there's, there's a philanthropy aspect to this, there's mm. a, a common good, but there's also, you know, a, a, a sort of like combine or, you know, um, you might get left out of the group altogether as well. So I think there's a more of an urgency in the space as mm. well. So mm. it, it's got a great opportunity to create something new mm. that in normal times might, might be much more difficult to achieve, especially, as you say, with that um, aspect of making sure that you've got the right procurement controls that sit yeah. beside these things as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, on that procurement piece, it's interesting because something I learned at DFAT is that there are the procurement rules and then there's the procurement behaviours. And um, sometimes people think the procurement behaviours are actually the rules. Um, and I know that HPW are doing some work to strip away the bits that are not the rules so it's really clear actually exactly what is it that really is uh, regulatory and, and what is just behaviour. Yeah, some things just grow over time. Yes, exactly, they? yes, yeah. Back to your point about the collaboration, I know something that uh, Leanne Kemp, um, the Queensland Chief Entrepreneur, is talking about is that government has some current partners. How do we help new partners work with those current partners as well? So you're talking about a group of new people, which is great, but also you can go with the current people and draw new people a, around them. Yeah, and that's probably um, an extension of where that first question came from, actually, so mm. that's, that's quite a good way to finish. This one's probably for both of you. Um, how, in, in light of the COVID-19 changes, are we working to, uh, to ingrain innovation in the government's culture? <laughs> 
What a great question, because that cultural piece, it, it gets forgotten a lot, um, but it is absolutely key, isn't it? Culture beats strategy for breakfast or Eats, something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Eats strategy for breakfast. Strategy for breakfast. Yeah, yes. Um, so yes, culture is really important, and obviously people have been trying to do this for decades. Uh, it is really challenging and, and, and hard going, and that's, I'm not saying that in a, to be too negative, but it is challenging for all sorts of good and not so good reasons. So what are we doing right now? Well, the first thing is we've had to, we've had to innovate. Um, you know, never, never waste a crisis, so, and, and I don't say that lightly because obviously the crisis is awful, but it is an opportunity to make the most of it. And so people ha are having to work differently. Um, I know some people in, in my team were surprised when we had to, t normally it takes, I think, two weeks to change um, some, some documentation within a process and they did it, they kicked it over in two days. You know, well done team. So they, they showed that it, that it could be done. Um, so that's one thing is showcasing that it can be done. So crisis means you have to adapt. The other one is showcase and celebrate the things that have been uh, working well that are showing that people are doing this and it's, and it's a good idea. I think the, the trick is going to be how do we then embed that going forwards. Um, and I think that because we're working differently and having to work differently, that will start that cultural piece to be a bit more embedded uh, as we go forwards. But it is a massive challenge. I've seen you know, all sorts of innovation programs in government in the past that, um, and I am going to be a bit critical here, um, become almost box ticking. You know, a government department will go, yeah, we've got our human-centered design group here, great, tick, we're doing innovation, when actually that's not embedding the culture across the whole mm. of, of government. Something that we're, um, we've been been working on and now we have a whole of government approval for is to run this open innovation approach which will be saying to government across government okay what are some of your challenges we'll help you go outside and look for some solutions and my the, our dream is that down the track we'll run that through some sort of a program which will draw government employees into it as well as people you know the, the solution providers on the outside to work together and I think that's another way if you can put innovative people in with innovative government people, um, you can grow that culture even more in government. But yeah, it's a, it's a, if you have ideas, please send them. Uh, and I'd, I'd probably just add a little into that, that no, I agree with Sarah that um, COVID-19 has caused disruption. So uh, government traditionally works very well on incremental improvements. So they change things slowly over time as they sort of get that sort of long view of how something's performing. Um, we're now in that situation where we don't have any of that um, ability to get that long-term view because we don't know how things are going to change, how they're going to react. So we have to be able to have a response really quickly that's just enough. And I think one of the things that we really need to look at in government is how do we get just enough to, to prove that we're doing and, and really focus on what, what demonstrates its value quickly and, and pivot to actually chase that rather than actually looking to get through all that incremental sort of view of things to try and get a perfect thing one, two, three, four, five years down the track. And, and I think that, that, that view about um, how we can be more agile will support that underpinning view of how can we be more innovative. Because I think if you start with a fixed mindset about how something's going to happen, then you end up um, perpetuating that as reality. So we need to be able to break with our current reality to look at a new one. Okay, great. Um, another question that just came through is um, how are Advanced Queensland and the Office of the Queen Chief Customer and Digital working together to implement change? So how are you, how are you guys both working together to implement change? Uh, so Sarah mentioned one part, so I'll let you talk about that one to start with. Well, we're a couple of new, newbies, yeah. both of us, aren't we? I'm three months in and you're two and a half yeah. months. Is that? Same <laughs> so Good timing for both of you. That, that, yeah. yeah, that helps, I think, yes. Um, both going through whatever everyone goes through in these, in these phases. But, yeah, so that piece around uh, people coming to us with ideas um, and making sure that we are triaging them effectively and that we are um, supporting the ones that need, a, need support from us or re realising that they're ones that Chris and his team can be looking after or they're ones that can go to health. So we've been working through that process and we, we just joined up on, on all well, of that. So that's, that's, a, that's one start. And, and I would also think that there are aspects around digital government and digital economy that we're actually yeah. working at. So how, how do we... So the very t first time Sarah and I met, we talked about um, why, why don't more parts of Queensland have a strong digital presence? Why don't we have um, more women? We were at a Women in Digital breakfast um, for International Women's Day. And 
uh, one of those things that came out was, is, well, do we have the right settings within government to do so? So I think the other part that we can do to work together, given that we are both quite new and that we don't have a lot of ingrained sort of commitments to the decisions that have been made in the past, um, some of that, not saying that those decisions are right or wrong, but we have a fresh set of eyes that come through it that can allow us to look at how can we look to invigorate um, the digital economy in, in Queensland especially, but not just in the southeast corner as well, right across the state. So really looking at how we can have all those, um, you know, Queensland has what, a couple of benefits in that its population is more distributed than some of the other states in Australia. Um, and we should be leveraging that as a, as a benefit. We also have some really great um, lifestyle areas within Queensland, many of which are supported pretty much just by the tourism industry. So how can we actually get other parts of the, the, the digital economy looking in those places? And that has to be about how we can work together to have the right settings and create the right environment for those areas to thrive in that way. Mm, I think there's that ecosystem I talked about, you know, both of our parts and other parts, not just our two departments, have got a say and a part to play uh, in that ecosystem building so that um, new ideas, new businesses, as well as current businesses can do things differently and learn new skills. The skills piece we've talked about yeah. too um, as a possibility, um, and it's early days, I'm sure there'll be many ways. I want your two-page procurement um, document or how, one whatever, page. one page, one page procurement document, please. <laughs> Oh, well, it's available to everyone. Excellent. Um, so another question here is, uh, what is your favourite example of innovation? Um, it doesn't need to be a long example um, of something you've seen in the last two to three months uh, outside, outside of IT. So Brisbane City Council yesterday did a live stream, I think using a combination of Zoom and YouTube to have their uh, announcement of who won all the, um, the awards, etc. So um, I thought that was pretty impressive. Mm. Um, something to put together so quickly. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd say, what's your favourite example of something oh, you've seen? Um, I hope it doesn't offend anyone, but my absolute favourite, I'm a physicist um, by training, and my absolute favourite has to be Gilmore. Um, down the Gold Coast, they're, they're uh, building rockets. Um, rockets that are uh, solid fuel and liquid fuel. They will be small, lightweight, inexpensive, or less expensive, um, <laughs> and they will be a key part of the microsatellite constellations that we will have thousands of up, uh, up in the skies that will need to be um, looked after. And they have a vision also of taking their rocket to Mars. So I'd have to say I'm pretty excited by So not Gilmore small enough for purchase for recreational purposes? <laughs> Probably not. No. <laughs> Depends on your recreation budget, Chris. Yeah, I think in, in, in terms of me, one of the things that I've actually just seen um, in terms of the best innovations are people's agility to respond to remote working. Um, you know, I, I've, I've seen um, people that I would have sworn would never do a face-to-face -face meeting mm -hmm. ever um, over a digital channel, be, be limited with no other opportunities mm -hmm. and then take to it like a duck to water. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, that opportunity to overcome fear or overcome, you know, preconceptions about how some of these things work um, is a great innovation for the human spirit in mm. a lot of ways. Mm. So uh, positive comments come through about the, um, I think it was about your comment, Chris, the uh, speed versus perfection. And uh, so I thought that was worth mentioning, that that, that got some good attention. Uh, there's another one here. Are there any exist challenges right now that government is looking at innovation to solve? Um, obviously, there's the very, very big obvious one, but breaking that down into chunks, is there anything that's right, really high on the government agenda mm. um, that government is looking for partners for? Yes, I think in the, for instance, with the care army, um, we have our lovely, you know, beautiful seniors who are locked at home. There's been a lot of work done to try and reach out to them and, and help them um, to get food to them. Um, I think one of the big challenges is the social infrastructure, uh, provide them social infrastructure for them. If they're stuck at home, they can't get out, um, how do we maintain that social infrastructure? I think there's an interesting piece, and I only say this because my mother has said this, um, how do we keep their confidence up? So m my mother is uh, about 76, um, she's, not, she's in England actually, in the UK, she's not allowed out, so she won't drive for I don't know how many months. Um, how do we keep people's confidence up so that they don't come out of this <coughs> having lost a lot of their confidence and then this has a serious impact on their health. Um, 
that's just one that I know from my personal experience, but I also know that uh, the care army is, is looking for, for solutions to that. I, I think um, those aspects of relearning, you know, how do, how do you actually build up your capability sets again after a period of isolation? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that same sort of thing, how can you actually support people in getting that build up of capabilities back? How, how can we get people in training? How can we actually ensure that there are uh, people that are able to um, support people to get back to where they were and hopefully get beyond that period mm. as well. Mm. And, and, you know, it doesn't take much mm. to take people out of the social fabric mm. and they get lost. Mm. And certainly uh, in my previous experience with Service New South Wales, that, that aspect of the vulnerable people and the yeah. vulnerable society, it's so much more difficult to actually get them out of the, the bad situation yeah. But if you can avoid them falling into that, then yeah. really there's some great opportunities in that space. Yeah, yeah. I'd also like to call out if any of you want to help any companies that are struggling from a mentoring perspective, if you've been through something like this and you've got some, <clears throat> some battle scars and some knowledge that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you too. Okay, well, there's actually, um, that wraps up most of the questions. Um, we've, we've covered, we've answered several questions at once a couple of times. Um, there, unless there's anything, I think there's one more slide just on to the end there. If you can grow, grow that forward. Oh, yeah. uh, Chris, if you would like to... Um... <laughs> so, so I think everyone, everyone can see the slide there. So we're actually looking for um, areas where you can actually try and send us challenges and offers of assistance. So that's the ICT industry engagement at hpw.gord.gov. Uh, online, um, it's going to look at business. We're going to show this, our, uh, the output of today is going to be moved to that side as well, mm -hmm. uh, to the business.qld.gov.au, uh, industries, science, IT, creative, slash ICT. I won't try and read them all because they're <laughs> sitting on the screen. Uh, the short form contract, which I'm sure everybody wants to download and use right now. Um, as I said, we are really looking to make sure that the procurement activities uh, are done as in a streamlined mechanism as possible. Uh, we're very conscious of one of the outcomes we want to get out of that is something has to be available quick enough to be of benefit. Um, it's no use having a great solution that we take 12 months to do. Uh, so um, if, if you are working with area, different areas of government and there is the questions around um, is, is this procurement process legitimate and valid? Um, you can absolutely point to that to that contract that's been fully approved by the broader procurement group within uh, Queensland Government, but specifically around the, the QITC function. Uh, and uh, also, I just wanted to probably point out the SME access incentive as well. There's a bug in here. <laughs> Terrible. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, but that is also a mechanism that we've always had in place in Queensland Government to support um, SMEs being involved in that. And as Sarah said before, quite often in partnership with uh, other bigger providers as well. So uh, that's it there. And Sarah, uh, I'll let you do yours about uh, your, your link down there. I guess if you want to be, that's, I haven't got my glasses on. Is that a link to my, me? The Ditter's my, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go and have a look at Ditter. We've got um, a lot of information there around support packages. So uh, it's, it's you know, clear all the ways that you can be helped. Please also go to the website of the Office of the Queensland Chief Entrepreneur. So Leanne and her team have got a great website with support there. Please join in with um, all the online uh, material and events and activities that the OQCE have going as well. Lots of support and connectivity that you can uh, join in on. Um, and please stay connected. And I might just have one more comment. Uh, last time we had some problems with the performance of the technology. So we had a little bit of uh, dropout within this broadcast. Very uh, happy to hear feedback from everybody as to whether uh, we think we've resolved all those problems, but please just tell us if we were actually dropping out. And as I said at the beginning, uh, there will be a recording of this whole session available for any of your colleagues who may have missed it but may be interested in hearing any of the things that Sarah or I have said today. So again, thank you very much for your time and we'll see you in a fortnight. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And so wrapping it up, um, we actually are scheduled to meet again in two weeks via this platform. Uh, so thank you to Chris and Sarah and everyone else who joined us this afternoon. We'll be sending out the slides from today's session and any um, additional bits and pieces that we can um, shortly after to the attendees. And uh, also for the next session, the 
uh, we'll be joined by Michael Nicklick from Corrective Services, and he'll be joining Chris uh, in, in the hot seat instead of Sarah. And uh, other than that, we'll see you again in a fortnight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.